Yeah. Hi, uh, welcome to the alternative session for uh, Tuesday afternoon. Uh, this is going to be a shared um, talk between Kimblers and, and myself. Uh, as you can see up here, Kim is the good looking one on the right. <laughs> or, or on my left. Um, and Kim is located over in uh, Deltsville, which is indicated by this nice looking strawberry there, which is over by Washington, D.C. Great place to have Kim located because everything she does directly applies to us here in the United So we're really great that, that we have that program so close to us. And I'm located over here on the Eastern Shore at the Y Research and Education Center. And, um, and again, it's very applicable to most of the people here because, again, and it applies to a good portion of the, the area. So, okay. Um, okay. We're going to switch off. Yeah, yeah. So this is a shared thing and, um, and um, just give me a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to do this. Uh, this is how we're going to do that. Um, I'm going to start, actually. Yep. And, um, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about terminology so that as we go through the different uh, management systems that we're using phrases that you've already heard because we're going to go through about a half a dozen of them so you know exactly what we're talking about. And then we're going to get into two different systems. We're going to talk about the annual plastic culture system when you plant in the fall, harvest, spring. And Kim's going to talk about establishing these annual plastic culture systems in the spring using day neutral plants and carrying them through the summer and then into a second year of, of harvest. Okay, so that's kind of how we're going to uh, to do this talk. So we'll be switching off a little bit as we go along. And um, if any of you have any questions, please feel free to ask them as we go along. Um, as we're talking about them, it might be easier to, to present an answer to you as, instead of waiting to the end and you say, well, just go back to the fourth slide or something. So please feel free to ask questions as we go along. And Kim and I really appreciate it that you chose to attend this pr pr presentation today. We're really happy about it. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. And um, are we just using the... Uh, uh, just like, the we'll just go like, like that. There you go. Oh, okay. Ooh, Here you go. So, okay. Take it away. Which one? This one? Okay. All right. So, first, can I ask who doesn't know anything? Hi. Who doesn't know anything? I haven't seen her in a long time. <laughs> who doesn't know anything about strawberries at all? Okay. Not at least much. one of. Okay. Not couple. much. Okay. So, okay. Good. Well, Mike mentioned the term day neutral. Day neutral is one of two types of strawberries. The column on the left are various names given to this group. The nurseries refer to it as day neutral. It has nothing to do with day legs, but that's another story. On the right is the other type of strawberry, commonly referred to by the industry as short day or June berry. But basically, you have the day neutrals have long seasons like months. The others have short season. We're talking about weeks. So here's an example. The black is an example of the season of your typical short day, June bearing, short season. The blue is not any typical any longer, but it basically is stretched out. I've gotten much better yields than this since 2012, which is the second year I was doing this. So if you are familiar with strawberries and some of the names, on the left are the long season day neutral types. On the right are some that are available now, the short season, June bearing, short day types. Okay, and what a, what a, uh, a unique plant strawberries are. I mean, uh, because if you got the, uh, the photo uh, sensitive part of, of it, day neutrals versus uh, short day, we also have a host of um, various uh, materials that we can get from the nursery to help us decide when we want, when we want to fruit our crop so we can plant different kinds of plants, uh, types of plants, um, trying to meet our uh, particular harvest schedule. So of course we have the... Uh, um, no pointer? No pointer. Better. Um, okay. So um, basically it all revolves around the runner tip, right? Because strawberry plants are, are basically vegetatively propagated unless you're a breeder, which you're doing crosses and you produce seeds and you got to grow seedlings and everything. But everything uh, revolves around the runner tip as far as how we produce strawberry plants. So everything is, is basically vegetatively propagated. So um, the most widely available plant types are the bare, uh, dormant, bare-rooted plants. A lot of nurseries grow them and have them um, on their sites. Uh, some nurseries can, can uh, have those available year-round. Uh, unfortunately, the nursery that we deal with mostly up in, in New England only, um, they shut off their coolers in July, so we can't get any bare-rooted plants past, past about the middle of, of July. And, um, but it is, it's very uh, valuable um, 
uh, source of plants if you want to grow your own runner tips. They, there's a lot of varieties out there that aren't produced in the, in the plugs, um, but dormant plants are available and you can actually make your own plugs if you want to. So dormant uh, bare root plants are very important. Of course, the plug plants, 50 cell plant, plug cell, uh, very typical of what growers use to plant in the fall in the annual plastic culture system. It's one of the more expensive types of plants you can, you can buy, but again, uh, yeah, very well adapted, easy to establish. You can hold the plants a little bit if planting is delayed. Um, in addition to that, and again, I don't uh, see this too much, but um, people are using it and it seems to be more of a niche crop. These are called super plugs. It's basically an older uh, uh, standard 50 cell plug, but it's, it's, it's a larger cell. Usually the, the, uh, the plant will be 60 or 90 days old, so it's ready to, to produce flowers and, and, and crops. So um, I don't think we're seeing much around uh, town with that crop or that type of plug being available, but I think in the future we're going to see, see it a lot more. Um, and then of course we have a couple other options, the fresh dug uh, uh, plant, which is actually dug in the fall while it's still living, so it has leaves on it. Uh, the, the roots are usually white and all, and um, it's used more in the south, but there are applications here in our part of the world where we can uh, plant it in the fall. Uh, they aren't available to later in the planting season, but there is there is a place for them. There's another one called a, a, uh, a cutoff plant, which is essentially a fresh dug plant, but it is without the leaves. Again, you use them uh, more in the south. We do have a grower in southern Maryland though, that is trawling them, uh, that type of plant, this, this, uh, this season. <coughs> So we take the type of plants that we want, knowing the harvest season, and we have all these different types of culture that we can that we can grow uh, these plants in. Uh, of course, a traditional uh, matted row um, perennial system that um, we're not going to talk about at all today, but it is still grown. A lot of acres are still grown as the matted row system. Uh, so more uh, recently, say recently in the past 30 years, uh, we've seen a resurgence of, um, of plastic culture annual system. Uh, so not only California and Florida are using that, of course we're using it up here in the Mid-Atlantic and out into the Midwest and everything. So it has become more of a popular type of growing strawberries. And when you couple that, uh, the uh, plastic culture system with uh, the use of tunnels, whether it's um, you know, high tunnels or, um, or even low tunnels, you know, multi-bay, single bay, um, you really can start pushing the, uh, uh, advancing the crop earlier in the season or taking it further into the fall without too much added uh, infrastructure other than the tunnels. And ultimately, the best, uh, well not the best, but another way that really increases your options is the use of out of soil production um, and growing in the greenhouse. I mean, probably the, we could probably get to your crop of strawberry uh, in, in Maryland probably eight months out of the year um, just using tunnels and standard practices but when you want to produce berries in the dead of winter you got to have a greenhouse because you're going to need supplemental heating and supplemental day length basically in order to get uh, plants to grow vegetatively for a while so greenhouse would be the only way that we could really accomplish good production in the uh, in the winter months. So strategic forcing is a term we've been hearing lately, and I can talk about a little bit more just to get you an idea of what strategic forcing is. Um, it's to advance uh, plant growth, basically, and, and normally we're going to be using floating row covers to do that. Basically, we're trying to increase the temperatures under the row cover to give the more growing degree days for the plant to, uh, to get growing, produce flower buds, and of course we can do that in the fall or in the spring, and again, I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, overwintering, these crops do need some sort of protection in the deep winter, mainly January, February months. Uh, right now, the go-to materials, um, if you're in that climate that you do need the frost or uh, cold, cold uh, uh, overwintering, um, we use floating row covers. And of course, if you know anything about floating row covers, you know they come in different weights, uh, usually expressed in ounces per square yard. Uh, the heavier the weight, the more cold protection they can give you. Uh, multiple covers are certainly an option. In fact, we struggled with a two ounce cover for years. <laughs> And what a workout that is uh, moving that around. So I, you know, I've gone to using multiple covers as opposed to one heavy cover. <laughs> but you got to understand there are limitations to how far these these covers can protect you because winds really decrease the effectiveness. And I'm going to go into a little bit that a little bit later. Straw mulch is the go-to material for the perennial matted row uh, system. It's it's locally available. Uh, you apply it to the rows in, in the uh, early um, winter, and then in the spring you can pull it back so the straw is in the alleyways. It gives you a nice walkway pass and everything. Um, there is some people that do apply to uh, plastic annual plastic culture beds. We we've, we've tried it at our site. We have a very windy site, and, and we found that it does uh, need to be reapplied at some point during the winter because a lot of it will blow off the uh, blow off the tops. But it is an option. Um, to use straw. 
Uh, frost freeze protection, like most fruit crops that we grow, they, they flower early in the, uh, in, in the, in the spring. And, um, but of course, that's still the window of, of having frost and freezes, so we need to have um, measures in place in order to protect the flowers and unopened flowers, actually. And usually the go-to uh, way to do that is uh, row covers, uh, sprinkler irrigation, possibly a combination of, of the two. Um, but really, you need to know um, what the critical temperature is for the stage of plant that, that it may be when temperatures look like they're going to take a nosedive. And so really, the only way that uh, you know um, how much frost protection you're going to need to provide is, of course, knowing how low, it, you know, how low a temperature is going to get. But you're going to need to know what the critical temperatures are for strawberry. And then if you've grown strawberries or any uh, tree fruit or, or, or shrub type of fruit crop, you, you've probably seen tables and pictures of you know, the different, you know, how, how much different uh, phenology of, of the plants are, are um, cold sensitive or not. And we go right down the line, basically a dormant uh, uh, strawberry plant can take down to about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe a little bit lower, maybe not as low. Um, of course, it, it's called somewhat cultivar dependent, and it can also depend on um, how dry the air is actually. Sometimes you can get a few more degrees of protection lower just because um, the dew point is lower and, um, and then something that what they call super cooling kicks in and the plant is actually able to survive lower temperatures than maybe sometimes of what we have recorded in the past. So 10 degrees is kind of a good baseline. If it gets down to that temperature, you got to start worrying about it. And um, so, so with 10 degrees is kind of the temperature. And then it, from there it goes, it goes, you know, it goes, the temperatures go up, uh, tight buds, it's in the teens, buds at the top of the crown teens, emerge buds, meaning they're just starting to elongate, but they haven't quite elongated 20 to 25. And of course, open flowers and popcorn stages, 30 degrees. So we got to know all that in order to know how much protection Put on. Okay, so that's kind of the background of some of the terminology we're going to use. So we're going to start uh, talking about the two systems, and I'm going to again talk about the annual plastic culture system, fall establishment for spring harvest. Okay, so on the annual, the annual, <laughs> annual system is in high input, high risk ag enterprise. Of course, the high risk is that a, you've got a lot of money invested in to get the crop in the ground. It blooms early. If you're not prepared to frost protect, you could lose a lot. So it is a high risk enterprise. But uh, strawberries have the highest potential to produce the uh, uh, maximum um, um, profit, basically, because of the yields that they produce. And, and as, um, as popular as they are, you get a lot of people you know, wanting your berries. So you can get uh, high yields of high quality fruit using this, this system. Uh, the plant type use, as I mentioned, you have the whole host of, of plant types that we can use in the annual system. Um, limitations, though, again, not every nursery, if you hope the plant plugs in the fall, uh, make sure you contact your nursery in June or even sooner to see whether they're going to have the variety that you're hoping to plant. Don't wait to August and say, hey, I'm planting September 5th. Do you have these varieties? And they go, well, not for you, but we, we grew them for all these other people that called us in June and we have them for them. So uh, always stay in contact with the nursery and sometimes they even will do more than they may have listed on their website or in some letters that come out saying, hey, we got these varieties. They may custom uh, a plug plant for you, you know, if you want a certain variety. They may do certain things. So, you know, keep in contact with your nursery producer if you want something that maybe is a little bit out of the uh, out of the usual. And of course you can use short day or day neutrals and, and, and plant those in the fall. Pre-bedding fertility, uh, fertility is roughly 60 pounds of nitrogen in, you know, before you make your beds. That's been, kind of been the standard uh, recommendation for many years now. Plus, whatever your soil test indicates, whether you need to, you know, potassium or phosphorus, um, you would add that prior to, uh, to, to, to bedding. And sulfur is one that we're starting to see more as a deficiency because um, it's no longer plentiful in the rainwater as it had been over the past decades. So we're starting to see more uh, sulfur uh, deficiencies in the plants. So it's something we may start to routinely apply. Uh, of course, we want high, high, high beds, crown beds to shed water, uh, drip tape, depending on if you have light soils or heavy soils, if you have a wider bed. Uh, I have a, usually use a 30 inch wide bed and we're in heavier soil. So I use one drip tape down the center of the field. If you have sandier soil, you may want to consider uh, uh, two drip tapes going down. Plant density can be anywhere from 10,000 to 17,000 plants per the acre, depending on your plants, your between row spacing and the in row spacing. 17,000 plants would be if you're on five foot centers and you're planting on a 12 by 12 inch spacing going down the row. Um, 10,000 would be something a little bit wider, further apart. Um, but that is the single 
single most expensive uh, part of this system is, is because it's a high density um, and plug plants are, are probably one of the more expensive uh, plant types that you can plant. But um, <coughs> you do need a lot of plants. So cultivars, there's a lot of cultivars and Kim's going to run over that a little bit later. Um, but you want to choose your cultivar based on the market that you're going to be serving. You know, are they are they going to be direct direct sales from your farm? Or are they going to be at your farm stand? As a pick your own, you can probably use a lot more varieties for that type of, of marketing than when if you want to ship them, because usually you have to have a firmer berry, something that's going to hold off you know, a little bit of transport. So you know, you might need to go with something like Camarosa. And of course, we're always going to look for disease-resistant plants. Planting date depends on your location. Um, Cultivar selection uh, plays a point, you know, a, a part of that on which, which, uh, when you need to plant. Uh, but right now, it's it's mostly your the area that you that that you're you're you're, you're planting. Okay, in Maryland, northern part of Maryland, west of 95, are planting earlier, um, later, late August or September. In the southern part of the state, southern Maryland, Lower Eastern Shore, we're looking more at the end of September. Okay. Um, some growers, again, down in the southern part of the state are using cutoff plants or fresh dugs, but they're always not available until after October 1st, so it kind of becomes difficult for us to really use them too much. Bare dormant root plants, you've got to get them in the plastic before mid-July, and that may be too late. Okay, so maybe earlier in July, and I have some data showing what a mid-July kind of thing looks like, um, the yield-wise. And of course, any time you go earlier you go in the year, you're going to have more runners produced, which means um, you're going to have more runners to remove over time and possibly winter cleanup of dead, dead runners that didn't get removed. So again, just, just some points of, uh, of note. Uh, strategic forcing in the fall with floating row covers. Okay, we're doing that to increase plant growth and flower bud initiation. We normally, I mean, over the course of the decades that we've been working at the annual system, we've always gone with using row covers only if we missed our planting date, meaning we got to plant later because of rain or plant delivery was delayed or something, or if we have cooler fall temperatures. We kind of did that routinely. Well, more recently, um, well, recently, actually started back in the early 2000s, Gina Fernandez down at NC State did some work where she showed that a, uh, deploying a floating road cover for as little as two weeks in the fall can increase your yields by about 14%. That's a pretty good increase, and uh, for a little bit of work, of putting those covers on for a short period. And, uh, and then Jeremy Patterson, even a little bit uh, less than 10 years ago, did some research where he basically um, uh, ran it through and basically said, yep, that is exactly right. You can get, you know, for as long as two weeks of row cover use in the fall. And um, you want to wait to put that row cover on when, uh, until uh, daytime highs uh, start going or below 65 degrees. Because when we put those row covers on, we routinely can get 20 degrees heat underneath that row cover. And at that point, for what we're trying to do, we don't want it higher than 85 degrees. Or I don't know if we ever wanted it higher than 85 degrees under the cover. But certainly not in the fall. And um, what they also came out with was that really the planting date really is the major factor in uh, high spring yield. So we don't want to discount uh, the correct planting date in lieu of just trying to put row covers. And um, it seems like that works better for varieties that require a higher growing degree day in the fall. I had a line up there and I didn't talk about it, but a Camarosa, Chandler requires about 600 growing degree days in the fall to make it satisfactory plant in the fall. Camarosa needs about 800, and we believe Ruby June, which is, um, I think some people think it's going to replace Chandler, is also along the Camarosa line that it needs more growing degree days. So um, that's why we would use uh, row covers in the fall. And we actually did a small trial a couple years ago um, where we planted four different planting dates in September. Um, we, w we let the plants uh, get act get, uh, grow and establish for about three weeks before we started putting the row, com uh, row cover on for two weeks. So on September 9th, we waited three weeks, put the row cover on for two weeks, took it off, and for each additional thing. And we did increase the heat units, uh, absolutely. Um, so with the floating row cover, it was 329 versus 220 without the row cover. So we did absolutely increase uh, uh, the growing degree days. And at the end, uh, by November 3rd, um, this was the amount of heat units that we, uh, that, we, uh, that we generated by doing this job. Unfortunately, it didn't really translate into a higher yield. So here's the yields for the following spring. Uh, nothing significant in this, although it does look like trending the higher, higher yields. I don't know if we had continued that on, whether that would have made a difference. And without a road and road cover, there was absolutely no difference between the uh, um, things. So this was Chandler and uh, Barclay Poling, who kind of s started this whole fall, or not started, but has been working with um, um, 
using real cars in the fall, said that, well, well, Chandler probably doesn't respond as well because it doesn't require as much heat. What so, was the road cover weight? Road cover weight? 1.2. That may be part of, part of that. Yeah, they recommend a lighter road light cover normally, cover. right? More light than yes, to allow more light transmission in and everything. That, that is exactly right. So there could have been a couple of things why it didn't work for us that year. Uh, overwintering, again, we have to do it. And generally, we think of overwintering wintering is January, February. Again, as mentioned, strawberry uh, crown damage can occur at uh, 10 degrees. And um, we prefer it, that it cools down slowly as opposed to being 60 degrees today, 10 degrees tomorrow. That would be worst case scenario. Roller coaster temperatures in the winter drive grower, growers crazy. It drives me crazy, um, and particularly when you have these January warm ups and it's like, well, if they're saying it's only going to last three days, well, is that enough to, to start the, the, the time clock going for, for strawberries to start growing? I, you know, I, I can't answer that. But I know if you start getting a week of warm temperatures with the road covers on, you probably want to go out there and take it off for a while. Um, of course, flooding road covers or straw are, are still our two best options for, for overwintering. Uh, most common floating road cover weights are 1.2 1.5 ounces that we use for this system. You can get heavy, you can get road covers up to 3 ounces if you really want to struggle with them, and you can get them down to 0.6 ounces, which literally rip each time you try to pull it. So again, that was maybe one of the reasons I didn't use an ounce, was because they rip very easily. They're not meant to, to last too long. Um, and again, high winds can really uh, decrease the effectiveness of floating road covers, um, but they do protect the leaves. Uh, and if you've ever grown the system, the leaves stay green all winter long. And um, it will cut the wind speed so um, we don't get those desiccating winds um, that can occur when, you know, in the winter if we, if we don't cover the, uh, the strawberries. Now here's some data actually from back in the, the spring of 2017. This was a terrible, terrible point in time. This was like eight days in March when strawberries have already started growing. In fact, some people had already removed their row covers from the winter for that point. Uh, but it was an extremely windy eight-day eight period. Uh, tempers, temperatures were, were not extremely low if we dig it down to 2021. The buds were right at the top of the crown. You could see them there. They hadn't started elongating or anything. So we put uh, one, two, or three row covers. And I just wanted you to direct your attention to the uh, March 12th. It was 10 miles an hour. The low temperature was 20 degrees. With wind row cover, it was not affected at all. We had damage, bud damage with that. We had one until we put that second cover on that it kept it above, uh, so we didn't experience any damage. Two days later, March 14th, it got down to 21. It had been colder the past two days. Um, 20 mile an hour wind speed, one cover didn't do it, two covers didn't do it. It wasn't until we put that third cover on, and then that was even a little marginal, whether or not we uh, experienced some damage or not. So flow co road covers aren't the, uh, the answer to everything, uh, but at this point, this, that's, that's what we have. With these wind speed, it would not have been feasible to do overhead sprinkler. You could do it. I know people have, experienced people have, have, have used them in that grade of wind, but you have to be very careful. Sometimes you can do more damage than, than good uh, by using sprinkler irrigation in touchy situations, particularly when you get wind speeds. Like How that. thick were they? What's that? How thick were these? How thick were these covers? 1.2. Uh, so again, so she forcing can also be done in the spring. Um, again, if you leave your covers on into the first bloom, those plants will flower sooner than if you had pulled the cover off you know, two, three, four weeks prior to that. So one way you can strategically use this is to, instead of uncovering your whole field, you can uh, uncover portions of it every 10 days, and that will spread out your harvest season a little bit. So, okay, so that's another way of strategic forcing. So time sequential further recovery. Uh, spring fertility, we want to add up to 40 pounds more of nitrogen in the spring. We usually apply 5 pounds of nitrogen at the first signs of new leaf, leaf uh, is coming out. And the only way that we really know the correct fertility to be applying um, at that point is through tissue, sam tissue sampling. But in general, we're going to be applying 5 to 7 pounds uh, per week over the course of the uh, next six, uh, 60 days or so, 50 days. Um, and you also may have, um, when you do your tissue sampling, you uh, come up with some other nutrition or deficits, primarily sulfur, potassium, and boron are the ones we see most, most often. Yields at the Y have been uh, historic over the past 20 years, 1.2 pounds per plant. Okay, and that ranges from anywhere from 0.6 to 2 pounds. Uh, we would like to see more 2 pound per plant uh, yields. 
uh, and we find the best indicator of those kinds of when those uh, high yield years occurs when we have mild winters. And I don't mean that we're losing flower buds during flowering. We've done a good job to protecting them in the spring, you know, when things are starting to flower. We think it's damage that's occurring possibly as they're coming out of dormancy and, and we get these Alberta clippers that come by and send the temperatures plummeting that we're getting those uh, um, damages, damage to the plants. So this is just a recent yield chart we had this spring. Uh, I just want to point out a couple things. Here's Chandler, which I indicated in the last slide that usually when Chandler does good, everybody else does good. Um, but you, you do see there are some plants, uh, uh, varieties that did not do quite as well. Uh, so 1.16 was close to the 1.2. Uh, Ruby June, which is uh, being purported to be the replacement for Chandler, did yield a little bit better, but not statistically more. Uh, three quarter ounce fruit size. Uh, AC Valley Sunset, I'd like to point out, and it actually it's in the commercial vegetable guide um, as a late season strawberry variety. We've run it several times. Uh, great, pretty decent yielder this year. It was very good. Uh, almost a one ounce, average one ounce berry size. It's a pretty decent size berry. And uh, it's one that I like to re uh, recommend if people want to carry over the plot for a second harvest year because it has such good berry size. Even the second year it has good berry size. And that's normally the one thing people complain about when you carry a bed over is that you get a lot of fruit, but they're, you know, they're small fruit. Um, without some, some crown management, um, that's the only way you're going to really uh, beef up your fruit size. But with AC Valley Sunset, uh, you, you have a pretty good shot of getting them anyway. Uh, trial we had in 2015, just to show that we can plant uh, um, day neutrals in the uh, um, bear, or it wasn't bear root, these were from plugs in the fall, just like Chandler San Andreas, yielded about the same as Chandler that year. Albion, which is again the go to variety, a lot of people like it, you're working with it more. Uh, but this is pretty typical if you try to plant it in the fall and harvest it during our normal spring harvest year, uh, year that's about the year you're going to get. It's not until several weeks after everybody else quit and you start applying more nitrogen and remove runners from Albion that will pick up and start producing uh, fruit throughout the summer. So Albion, again, this doesn't show the true uh, value of Albion, but just to show you that uh, the yield that you would get just in the just traditional harvest period after a fall planting. And then finally, this was the dormant bear root trial we had. And um, uh, it wasn't a great year, year. Chandler did okay. And again, we didn't plant these till July 21st or 23rd out and bare rooted on black plastic. And um, Seascape, which is day neutral, was the best, the best one that year. Um, AC Valley Sunset uh, wasn't as good as this year that we did, um, but still had very decent uh, fruit size, at least three quarters of an ounce. So uh, that's it for my little portion of the uh, program. Kim's going to move on. We're still here. Okay. All right, so the most common fruit rots in the world are anthracnose fruit rot and botrytis fruit rot. There you go. So to control botrytis fruit rot, there's not a whole lot of strong resistance. There are some that are some cultivars that are more resistant than others, but cultural practices are a real help with botrytis fruit rot. With anthracnose fruit rot, though, we do have uh, several resistant cultivars. At Beltsville, when we trial uh, cultivars and develop cultivars, we don't use any fumigants, no fungicides. If they are susceptible, we want them to die. The ones that boxed in in red are from our program with yields. Like I'm showing you yields. These are the kinds of yields that we've gotten. This is over a nine-year average. There are six uh, anthracnose-resistant cultivars. Um, not just for the Mid-Atlantic, but yes, for the Mid-Atlantic, Sweet Charlie, Early Glow, Galetta, Flavor Fest. Sweet Charlie's from Florida, Galetta's from uh, North Carolina, and the rest are from our program. So Sweet Charlie is, I'm going to tell you about a little bit about these cultivars in order of season, but can you see? That's okay. All right. I'm sure. so, um, so Sweet Charlie is the first to come out, so of course it's wonderful to see, and it's Bob's favorite. Tastes uh, good. Yes, well, so does an early glow. Okay, so everybody has their own personal favorite for taste, too. So It's nice for an early variety, and if you're lucky, you may get a second set in early June. Yeah. It's not, it's not one you want to play with if you're not going to cross protect. Yes, that's... And it's not one you want to push, and if you've got your covers on and it turns warm, like Mike says, you're going to get to try this crown right in it, so you've got to keep peeking under the covers right. on that right. Okay. And, and some people have explained to me that Sweet Charlie is one that sometimes it'll be too cold. Sometimes the winter will be too hard on it because it's, it can be a little tender sometimes if you're north. Early Glow is next in line. It's uh, really 
good tasting. It's been kind of the gold standard for flavor, but its problem is that it's fairly small. Notice all of these are on black plastic, so these are all suitable for the annual system, annual, annual plastic culture system. Galetta is from NC State. It's big. It's uh, very attractive. It has good flavor, though it's variable. Uh, Flavor Fest is one developed in ours. So now we're in the mid-season. High yield, big berries, rain tolerant, which has been important in the last couple of years. It doesn't crack in the rain. And uh, excellent flavor. My favorite flavor is Keepsake, which is not widely available yet. It's brand new out. It was developed for long shelf life, which I think is a you know, kind of a problem with strawberries. They don't really last. I wanted to put a stop to that. So not only that, but this thing is the sweetest, and I love it. So I hope you guys get the chance to try it. I can't wait, really. All Star is the latest of the six that I'm mentioning that are resistant to anthracnose fruit rot. It does have a problem with rain, though, so be careful of that. Uh, if you're not in an area that gets rain, you don't have to worry about it. We never used to have to. Only in 2016, 17, 18 did I realize it has a problem with rain. Okay, we did a, Mike and I contributed to a, a taste panel, trained uh, flavor evaluation panel. People that were trained and then they rated different cultivars. I produced five cultivars that were this long season type. Mike produced five cultivars that were the short season type. And then they were all rated together because they all grew at the same time, which is nice. It's kind of fun. Flavor Fest, All Star, and Early Glow were rated as having the top flavor in or overall quality of the um, short season types. Flavor Fest and All Star were the sweetest. And then that was a little bit. See, I told you I did that. Whoa. Okay, I'm switching to, to what if you want to really grow strawberries all year long? What if you want to grow them from April through December, which I have done. It is possible. You have to be a little crazy, but, you know, <laughs> it's possible. What if you want to take advantage of these great prices you get in November and December? And by the way, the fruit this time of year just tastes fantastic. There's not a whole lot of yield. But they're they're growing real slow. And they sweeten up. And they're so anyway. They're big, pretty. If you are going to do it, I strongly re recommend that you use some kind of protected cultivation. I wanted to use low tunnels because well, I'd heard about them and they they actually weren't really being used in our area until I started using them. And. Uh, I just knew that if we had a big storm that came and wiped out high tunnels, that nobody would come and help me and put them back up again. So I had to develop something that I could fix and manage and I could put together myself. So um, one of the reasons I say you really want to use some kind of protective cultivation, and I strongly recommend low tunnels, is because I compared low tunnels with open beds. First thing to notice here, the gray is open beds. The blue, I guess it's blue in this slide, is, um, is the low tunnels. Notice how the blue starts earlier here. You get earlier season. Notice how it stays longer. The difference between the solid lines and the dashed lines are the amount of <coughs> rot that you get. You get a lot more rot in open beds, fruit rot, than in uh, low tunnels. The most important one is, again, our friend Anthracnose. I just love this slide, so I use it a lot. If you've seen it before, I'm sorry, I love it. Okay, and Botrytis. Again, like I said before, these are the two major problems. But we didn't see these under the low tunnels, except for one year when I messed something up that I'm going to tell you about later. Okay, so maybe you're worried, oh, I don't want to have to raise and lower and raise and lower the sides of these low tunnels. I mean, I didn't either, so I developed a system so that when I make the tunnels in the spring, as you plant them in the spring, if it's really cold, I leave the sides down. If it's not really cold, I raise the sides up and they stay there till September. I don't raise and lower, raise and lower. They stay there till September. Sometime in September, I lower them. They stay that way until I want to let them go dormant. And instead of using row covers and straw, I just lifted the sides. That's the best winter protection I own. Really low input. If you're worried, well, doesn't it get hot under those low tunnels? Well, with the sides up, unlike high tunnels, it doesn't create its own little weather system in there. They're small enough, the wind blows through, and there's really only a few degrees difference, a little bit warmer in the low tunnels. There are kits. I want you to know that there are kits available. This is one that 
and Mike has had experience putting together. Or, because we're close to Pennsylvania, we can get cheaper steel than most people around the rest of the country, and so this is my homemade version after several years of getting it better. Anyway, either way, you plant in the spring, you make the beds, you put, I put two rows of trickle in because you've got this tunnel over the top, rain is not going to help you, so you need, you need to have really close water supply. I think it's worth the effort. And then we added straw between the beds. It helps with erosion and weeds and anthracnose, reduces those, you know, because some, anyway, long story. But you don't get anthracnose if you put straw between the beds. And for some strange reason, it keeps the foxes from tearing up the beds overnight. We plant with, yeah, I don't know why. We plant with bare root dormant plants, so that gives you a wide selection. You don't have to worry about whether plugs are available because they're harder to get. You can plant bare root dormant. And yes, you can tractor plant. We do this. This, are you in it? That's you, Jen. <laughs> anyway, uh, we do tractor plant. This is actually plug planting that we're doing, but this next slide, the far left bed and the far right bed, were bare root dormant plants, tractor planted. It's, it's really easy. And then you put the tunnels up because it's a little hard to track the plant with the tunnels up. Anyway, <laughs> then you, so basically you've got the T posts on either end. You've got hoops every five feet, uh, baling twine. I like that. I tried to look for a use for duct tape, but baling twine. And then you get it all ready and then pull them up and there they are. Tie them down. It's like sewing. Anyway. Uh, some little management tips, fertilizing with five pounds an acre of N at the beginning to get the plant going, removing the flowers, get them thinking about being a plant so they're in good shape to support fruit, then later reduce to two pounds an acre, harvest often, and water, be very careful, water only after you've just harvested. You don't want to push water and expand that fruit like a balloon uh, on ripe fruit because this is what happens. Mucor, which is everywhere, related to black bread mold. Mucor um, will, will get in there and overnight you'll get mush berries, is what I call them until I had our plant, our fungal taxonomist identify it as mucor. Bad stuff. But water is very important. Low tunnels seem to conserve water better than open beds. We got bigger fruit even though we have watered them all the same. Frost protection can be done in multiple ways. I've been using the, the water. Whether the sides are up or down, you don't actually have to get plants wet to frost protect them. That's with water. That's an interesting thing that I learned accidentally, you know, even though the dogma is no, you have to get water on there. It's an old dogma, but it turns out it's not true. And it's very effective. With the sides down, I don't I know you can't see this, but the temperature here in black and blue got down to 18.95 degrees, but look at that purple line steady all the way across. Oops. Anyway, um, <laughs> it, it's, it really works. It's amazing. It does have a downside. Uh, make it loose. <laughs> and you have to remove the ice. I was having fun there, okay. But you have to remove the ice before the sun comes up, because when the sun comes up, half the tunnel melts and the other half doesn't, and it goes, you know, and it crushes it, and then it's a, a lot of work to get it back up. So. Uh, that's why I would like to learn more about using row covers. I tried it once before. I told you that I'll tell you how I messed up something. I tried it once and unfortunately the humidity went up because I used both row covers and sprinklers. The row covers froze in place. I couldn't get them off like I could with just plain ice. And the humidity went up and I got botrytis that not only wiped out my fall crop, but the following spring as well, which is a real waste because when I show you how much the yield can get in the next spring, you'll see why that was a bad thing. And then sometime in the fall, when you when it's time to lower the sides, when it's when the highs are only like 65 degrees or so, you lower the sides of the tunnel so the straw doesn't get in there, and you shoot more straw over the top because the straw degrades through the year, and it's nicer to walk on it when it's not, you know, you're sliming all over the place, and you're still picking through December, so it's nice to have nice clean straw to walk on, and again, there's erosion and um, weed control. A couple of little 
construction tips, I'm not going to belabor this too much, but I tried thinner steel to, you know, because somebody told me I wouldn't be able to bend the thicker steel. Not you, but you've heard it before, I'm sure. Anyway, quarter inch steel or more. I use quarter inch steel. I've never tried to use anything more, but I would never, ever, ever have used lightweight steel because the tunnels will flop too easily. Also, people just instinctively, they want to tie that plastic really tight from end to end of the tunnel. They're going to pull it so it's really tight. That's the worst thing you can do. Tighten it on the hoop. Otherwise, those end hoops will go like this, then you've lost your tension and the whole thing comes apart. So another thing, I, you know there's, you may not know, but there's lots of different kinds of plastics out there that you can put over the top. And I wanted to know what kind is the best. At first when I started doing this research, I started with what they call standard clear. But then I wanted to try a couple that blocked uh, IR light or infrared light, which is equated with heat. And I wanted to try some that were supposed to block out, um, they were supposed to, to be nice to cool the temperatures underneath. So for four years, I tested these. I also worked with a collaborator at Bellsville, David Fleischer. And one of the most interesting things to me, maybe some of you already knew this, but strawberries really can't absorb more than about 50% full sunlight. So I was really surprised to see this. But it's nice because in the wintertime, you don't get that much. But I did learn also, he actually he learned it, told me, that under the tunnels, the plants can process light 46% more efficiently than in the open, which I thought was pretty interesting. And some, they, they, you can just tell looking at them. They look happier under the low tunnels. Their, the leaves are more relaxed. The, the thinking is it's diffusion that's causing it, but I don't know for a fact. So here's the four, uh, four kinds. There's two in blue that are supposed to cool the plants. I thought these would be nice in the midsummer, August, September when it's really hot. And then there's the standard clear is up there on the top. Standard clear and the green one, which is IR diffusing. Not blocking, but diffusing. So they're really about the same. And then the, the cooling plastics are very different from everything. So using multiple cultivars, just quickly looking at yield, percent rot, market score, marketable yield, and very weight. Monterey was above average most of the time. Uh, Albion was above average for most of those trades, except it's a little light on you. Portola is a little light on, well, it rots. It gets more uh, botrytis than most. Uh, not botrytis, sorry, mucor. Um, also, it seems to be getting, it seems to attract Drosophila, um, Spondylum Drosophila, which of course makes it vulnerable to everything. And then, just quickly, of all the films, this IR diffusing one test seems to be pretty good for all of them. So I think I'm going to be switching to that. Um, interestingly, those three cultivars yield more the year of planting, so that's from about July 1st through the end of December, than they do the following year, which is mid-April through the end of June. And the, the test film that I was telling you about helps compensate from that because, for that because it helps produce uh, more yield in the year after planting. All right, overall quality for these data was the same test. Uh, we got Albion and Monterey, which were two that I already listed, were best. Portola, Portola just doesn't have any flavor. That's the problem, at least not in our fields. In other places it does. So when it comes to cultivars, even though I'm a breeder and I have my favorites, I would strongly recommend try multiple varieties and you never know, something may do really well for you that doesn't do well for others. This is how the yields have changed. There's four years of data here, four different bars each month. And notice how they got higher every year? That was my learning curve. I, I strongly believe that was just a reflecting my learning curve. So when you start this, or anybody that you work with that starts this, start small and work up as you get better at it. Okay, if we have time, I want to... So, let's say you've never grown strawberries before and you're mostly agronomic, which is meaning has a lot of agronomy in it. What, how is this going to fit into your crop rotation? The one we use is right up here. Top left, plant strawberries. Then, you, the next year, you fruit strawberries. Uh, take out the field, plant rye vetch. Follow the next year with something that you can use. Um, 
commit on because our biggest problem weed wise is yellow nut sedge and strawberries and then follow with rye vetch again soybeans uh, roundup ready soybeans allow you to kill uh, nut sedge another way follow with rape which is a bio use that as a biofumigant um, maybe another crop of rape in the spring don't let the rape go to flower because it'll attract thrips the the other problem on the mid, in the mid-atlantic expect especially the delmarva is nematodes so anti-nematodes here are the the rye and the uh, sudex and if you want to substitute the sorghum you can um, and the rape did i miss any okay Oh, okay. Uh, this is actually the second last slide. So, if you uh, want to substitute in some vegetables, these are the these. This is old data. Strawberries are up to sixty-five thousand dollars an acre nationwide average value. Um, but but these other crops you can see have have good values. But you don't want to rotate in with strawberries anything that's susceptible to verticillium. So no tomatoes, no peppers, no melons, no cucumbers. But your um, cabbages and, and mustards are fine. And then there's even sweet corn, which you can substitute and permit with. And so we got a couple minutes for questions. Any questions? Is there any headway on increased propagation of flavor pest? Actually, we went backwards on that. I was real disappointed that Lassen Canyon quit producing plants for the plug producers. And so we're scrambling to find more people to produce those. For bare roots, there's plenty. The, the supply goes up and up. Demand is still going up too, but yeah, and as far as replacing Chandler, mm -hmm. Kim's never, well, owns never, but she's not a big fan of Chandler. So. Well, to be fair, the way we grow it is not its best way. Right. And you don't want to put straw on Chandler. Exactly. See, we That's one, one of the things you observe here is Chandler and some of these California guys never go, never go dormant. And if they don't go dormant, they're still taking the light even through the no cover. When you put straw on it, they're not getting the light. They're not dormant under there. We did it two years in a row at the Y, and we took 4,000 pounds of the acre off them. And if we'd have done it a third year, I think we could have got a journal article, but we, we, we saw enough. So you've got to be careful with the straw. The one nice thing about your varieties, they don't need as much nitrogen as the California varieties, which is really nice. And the uh, same thing with Sweet Charlie. Sweet Charlie doesn't need as much nitrogen. So if you're going to grow organic, some of the material she's got is exciting. I think this keepsake's going to be a nice one to look at. But, you know, oh, and I wanted to mention, since you mentioned how firm Camarosa is, keepsake had the same firmness as Camarosa, which really surprised me. Because some people say Camarosa is too firm. But anyway, your question was, I, I do think that we're scrambling a little bit, but it will continue to improve slowly. And, and as Mike said, if you want a cultivar, ask your nursery, ask early. So they cut worms this year. Which? Um, I'm coming, uh, Maplewood? Q-Pack. Q -Pack. Okay, but Q-Pack was able to sell some flavor fest? Well, they had it. Good. But they, but they would, but, you know, when you need, right. you know, 100,000 plants and they send you 10. Ooh. Ouch. Yeah. That's, that's not going to work. And um, what's worrying me is from where I am in the world is that although we continue to see the value in that variety, its quality and its, and its sustainability and that it's so much more tough, it's so much tougher. We've always seen it since you were, since it was a number, it was such a tough plant. But if they can't get it, they're going to stop fooling with it. Great. I, and I worry about these we, things. We really need some way to make sure we're getting a consistent plant population at the right time because we really want like that late August plant plug and we're just, where are we get them? More nerdies are starting. I mean, Cottle has it now.